The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario is applying to bring in a conciliator to try to bring the union and the province closer to getting a deal done. Now, the union represents about 83,000 public school teachers and support personnel. ATFO says it plans to move forward with a strike vote this fall. On Friday, the government and the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation announced a plan to head to arbitration if a negotiated contract agreement can't be reached by October 27th. ATFO leaders say that solution doesn't address their key issues like violence in the classroom. ATFO President Karen Brown says Minister Lecce has not reached out to her to arrange a meeting with her for more than two years. Minister Lecce's offer to meet every day is a hollow soundbite much like its government's so-called historic investments in public education that results in cuts. Put simply, their words are political smoke and mirrors. You can be present at the bargaining table forever, but if you aren't prepared to offer anything or move off your positions or even have an actual discussion, being at the table won't magically result in a deal. And for more on this, let's bring in the Education Minister, Stephen Lecce. Minister, good to have you in studio. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. So I want to get to Karen Brown's statement that we just heard in a moment, her comments. But first, I want to talk about, you know, ETFO filing for conciliation. Right. What's your response to that? Look, I'm disappointed because we've laid out a credible path to get a deal. And it seems, you know, I think disconnected from what I'm hearing from parents that want all the parties to do everything humanly possible to provide some stability for these children after three really the last many difficult years for kids. Their priorities must triumph here. And what we've done is we've offered to ETFO to do, use private mediation to force all the parties to get a deal. They rejected that. We then said, okay, let's try and let's offer another olive branch. Let's keep negotiating for the next few months. Then any outstanding issues, we turn to an interest arbitration system that ETFO and the school board and the government collectively agrees on, mutually agreed upon person to as an arbitrator. They denied us that. And today we're halfway through our discussions with them and they made a decision to proceed on a path to a strike when everyone in Ontario is sending a signal to us all to be the adults in the room to put the welfare of these kids first. So I'm disappointed, but I still want to remain cautiously optimistic that some of the high emotions can come down. And we remind ourselves, particularly for the union, that you know our kids depend on us to work together, to put their interests first. And nothing should come in the way of a child's ability to learn with their friends in front of their educators, found, building those foundational skills that they've lost. So I'm still gonna lean into what is possible through collaboration. I'm gonna still encourage the ETFO president and the leadership to work with us to come to the table to meaningfully look at this good fair offer and sign a deal like we just did with OSSTF to provide stability for teachers, for families, but most especially for these kids who I think are quite excited by the prospect of playing sports, doing clubs, being with their friends for three amazing uninterrupted years. We I, owe it to them. And I know that's what you, you've been hoping. You've said yeah. vocally, you know, obviously that uh, you're hoping the other unions will sign something similar that OSSTF signed with you yes. in terms of binding arbitration. Um, but we did hear from Karen Brown today from Atfo saying that the needs of Atfo are different from a secondary school, for example. Right. I mean, do, do you, what do you think about that? Well, look, I, what I've always believed, it's not about, you know, her or I. It's actually about the two million kids that are in publicly funded schools, and they need us to come together to do the right thing. I mean, if it's good enough for OSSTF on a tentative basis for those members, for our nurses, for our teachers, uh, you know, likewise for our doctors, interest arbitration is a credible method in the absence of getting a voluntary settlement negotiated. It just seems fair. It's, it's what allows kids to keep learning. So I think that has to be the priority. I mean, yesterday I announced a plan for the back to schools and we're going back to basics. We're really leaning into reading, writing and math, improving fundamental skills, giving kids confidence and life skills um, to be ambitious, to get good jobs, to graduate with confidence. But none of that matters. Like the 2000 teachers we're hiring in Ontario this September, the nearly 700 million more dollars in base funding we're putting in place for this September. It just doesn't matter if they're not in school. And so I'm urging the union and ETFO and the other unions respectively to hear me that we want to work with you. We want to get a deal. We want to ensure kids stay in school. And I'm urging ETFO to, you know, step back from this path to a strike, especially when we've made so many overtures, we've made so many good faith efforts to keep them at the table. So stay at the table, work with the government, let's get a deal that keeps kids in class.
We played a clip there off the top from uh, right. Karen Brown, the FO president, saying that in the last two years of discussions, um, she claims that she, you've never reached out to her directly, and she's heard from the Premier Doug Ford uh, right. very seldomly as, as well. What's your reaction to hearing that from her? You know, look, we've been negotiating for a year. I mean, in the words uh, for OSSTF, we have made a great effort uh, with them to try to negotiate a deal. We've got another two months to go. You know, we're going to keep working at the table. There's a, there's a way to settle outstanding issues. It's by staying at the table, not walking out and proceeding on a strike. How we achieve stability and peace for these kids and for their members is by staying at the table and getting a deal. So I want to decouple the personal side of this. It, it just isn't about her. It isn't about me. It's about the children we represent, and we owe it to them to come together. So I'm urging ETFO to get to the table, stay at the table, work with us on a deal. If it worked for OSSCF, if it worked for high school public teachers, why would it not work for public elementary teachers? If it works for our doctors, our nurses, and so many sectors of the economy, it just seems like a reasonable path if we can't negotiate a deal. We're going to keep, though, negotiating until October 27th, make every effort to get this deal done and give the predictability parents deserve. I do take your point that it's not personal, but do you think maybe if you reached out to the EPFO president and discussed the issues that are kind right. of keeping uh, the negotiations from moving ahead, that that might do something? You know, what I've, what I've learned, I think, just as being a, as a young person in our, in our politics, is that throughout my entire life, 35 plus years, there's been education unions, as, you know, withdrawing services or striking against the government of the day. Bob Ray, Mike Harris, Kathleen Wynne. You know, uh, Dalton McGinsey, Doug Ford, they don't have a lot in common per se, but we've all endured this for a generation or two. So, you know, I, I understand that. I'm a student of history. We see this. People know this. But I also keep reminding myself and, and the people that I work with that if we stay zero focus, if we have a, a real laser focus, rather, uh, on deals and on encouraging them to come to the table, I actually think the result will be peace. And if I can provide, as I said, for a high school student that started last September, for the next three years, they're going to be able to graduate without the threat of a strike. I mean, what an amazing achievement for children, for their stability, for their recovery uh, and their success. So we owe it to them. And therefore, I, I find it disappointing, surprising, uh, unfair on kids that they're now on a path to a strike when we've now demonstrated with another large union that we can come up with a tentative agreement, a process to avert a strike that allows us to respect all the parties. And I just would urge ADFO to do the right thing for the sake of these young kids. I mean, we're talking about elementary children, mm -hmm. the most impressionable kids. They face some of the greatest impacts of the pandemic. We see in grade three and six EKO data, reading, writing, and math has regressed. We need them to stay in school. We need them to benefit from our new language curriculum that introduces phonics and cursive writing um, and critical thinking skills. We need them to benefit from 2,000 more educators and 700 million more dollars of funding. But they need to be in class, and that's our that's our mission. That's our priority. Okay, I want to switch gears now and just yeah. talk to you about something that some comments that you've made that have garnered a lot of attention. Sure. Uh, when we're talking about you know children in school and pronouns, gender identity, this comes after an Angus Reid survey that was released uh, on you know children's pronouns. Um, you said that parents must be fully involved if their child chooses a different pronoun at school. Uh, now. I want to get some reaction first. We've been we've been getting reaction from people, including the former Premier Kathleen Wynne, on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to play that first for you. So we'll just take a listen. This policy could put children at risk. Um, as PFLAG has said, uh, if a child is not ready to tell a parent that he or she is thinking about who he or she is, um, who they are, um, then you could put that child at risk by disclosing that in a form letter to uh, a parent. And, you know, for some kids, school is the safest place in their lives um, because home is not safe, because parents are homophobic or transphobic, and the, the children know that. So what do you think? I mean, is that yeah. still your opinion, that you believe uh, parents must know and, and you know, a, a, if a child wants to change their pronouns or their, their sure. gender? What are, your, what are your thoughts? You know, I, I look at this and I come at this from a really a place of compassion uh, for those kids and for the families impacted. I mean, these are, these are kids. These are human beings. They deserve dignity and respect. We have to treat this with the respect this sensitive matter deserves. My point simply and broadly uh, is that I believe most parents live for their kids, love their kids, would do sacrifice and do anything for their children. That The instinct of the overwhelming majority of parents in the province is to support their children through difficult decisions that they may make or experiences they may have. And therefore, if that is the instinct, 
my hope is that we can be transparent to empower parents to support their children. I don't want scenarios where, you know, we're not being transparent. And that could lead, that lack of engagement or collaboration with the parent to support the child could lead to health implications for those kids. We're aware of some of the mental health challenges and others that deal with some kids from the broader community. So I just think engagement is important. But I will say, just dealing with the issue of safety, you know, it, our educators do great work in our schools. They have, they're trained to understand if, if there is, God forbid, risk in a small minority of, of cases at home where homes may not be safe places. They know exactly what to do, who to turn to, to ensure the safety of that child. That would continue tomorrow as it did yesterday. So my priority is just ensuring that they are supported by their families and more importantly, that their parents are given an opportunity to support their kids. And that transparency, I think, is important. Some child, some children might not be transparent about what's going on at home, though, you know, in terms of maybe having an abusive parent or guardian, for example. Mm -hmm. um, school boards and, and, you know, teachers might not know about that. So mm -hmm. is it not maybe up to the child to determine their level of safety at home? Yeah, the safety of children is what matters most. It's what I said yesterday when I asked, I led with that message. The safety of the child, every school, every kid has to feel safe and confident that they could be who they are. Uh, my point simply is to make a case as a, as a sort of broad policy position. I think parents want to support their kids and they've got to be aware, fully aware, what's happening in the life of their children. We're talking about, you know, for some of our elementary kids or young kids in high school, uh, I think parents feel like they need to be aware of what's happening in their kid's life if they want to help them succeed, keep them mentally and physically safe. And so I take a you know, different position than obviously uh, others. But I think a lot of parents just want to know, be in the know because they support and love their kids. And if we can really ensure that in the schools they are supported, they are affirmed, they are safe, we respect the rights of parents, we ensure they're aware and informed of what's happening to their kids, I actually think we could ensure the greatest safety and the greatest success for children. That's my number one priority. Every child should feel safe. Every child should feel respected. We've seen some gender and pronoun policies adopted in other provinces like Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, uh, where students who are under the age of 16 must actually have the consent of their parents mm -hmm. to change their pronouns or given names at school. Is that something we can expect in Ontario? You know, what I've simply said is that we think parents need to be more in the loop. They need to be more aware, fully aware of what's transpiring in the life of their children. Uh, I made that clear as minister. I think that's important for school boards to hear that message. Uh, I think at the end of the day, the more we empower parents to support their kids, the more successful their kids will be. And that's a broad message I'm sharing with school boards in Ontario. But I, I do want to emphasize safety will always prevail for every child in Ontario. So is that a no then, that there won't be any policies implemented this September in terms of, of that in our schools? What I'm simply communicating to parents is that we respect their rights. And I'm sharing with school boards the importance of school boards listening to the priority of parents, which is that they need to be involved in the life of their children. Okay, Minister Alcha, I appreciate you taking the time to come in today. Thank, Thank you. you.